No one gave anything to me. It was really up to me. So just going to school, just doing the best I could in school, everything was really just my responsibility. And I think it's really made me into just a much more productive person. So I had to figure out on my own, how do I succeed? What do I do to succeed? What is really interesting to me? What do I want? What is my life going to be like? You never really know, but it was really my responsibility to fight and do and make it, make my own direction. Welcome to Diggs Influencer Podcast, the Titans of Real Estate, the show that provides direct access to the real estate industry's top movers and shakers as they share invaluable insight on how to best navigate and succeed in any market. I'm your host, Warren Dow, founder and CEO of M3 Media and publisher of Diggs Magazine. Sally Forster Jones may be a household name in the real estate industry where she continues to set records as one of the top agents in the U.S. with over $6 billion in lifetime sales. But it's not her performance as an agent that makes her remarkable. It's the journey she's taken to get there and the purpose that drives her to stay on top. It's a great American success story and one that I know you'll enjoy. So let's start from the beginning, Sally. Your life's journey is inspiring, uplifting, and empowering. To begin, your parents were Polish Holocaust survivors and immigrated to the United States from Germany. What was your childhood like growing up? I grew up in a, I'm going to say, a lower middle class family in Brooklyn, New York, and my parents were immigrants, and so they were finding their way in New York and and in life and a whole new experience because, as you said, they were Holocaust survivors and they had gone through some terrible times and this was a new life for them. And so here I was growing up with that as the just my my family experience and just, you know, a lot of responsibility with that because when you have parents who have gone through a lot, you want to try and be everything that you possibly can to make it sort of worthwhile for them to have put in all that effort to just you know, fight and survive and uh, move forward. And so that was a lot of responsibility for me. And I read that when you were, you were 12 years old when you actually went out for the first time and ate at a restaurant. Yes, that's actually, that is the truth. Again, it was a lower middle class family. And so we didn't go out to eat. My mom cooked. And so I had a uh, girlfriend of mine and her family who took me out for, for Chinese food. And that was like a major experience. So that was my first restaurant experience. And that was at 12. Wow. Do you have sisters or brothers? I have a brother. I okay. have a younger brother. Younger brother. So it truly incredible just from, you know, skipping to where we are today, what you've accomplished, which we're going to get to in a bit. But, you know, coming from those very, very humble beginnings. But I think in a way, that's sort of really in your DNA and why you've become so successful, right? I don't think you've taken anything for granted and you understand, you know, what you put in is what you get out, right? Yes. So I was, it was not a privileged environment. No one gave anything to me. So, I mean, my parents tried, but it was really up to me. So just going to school, just doing the best I could in school, everything was really just my responsibility. And I think it's really made me into you know, just a much more productive person. I had to figure it out. I had to figure it out on my own. How do I succeed? What do I do to succeed? What is really interesting to me? What do I want? What is my life going to be like? You never really know, but but it was really my responsibility to fight and do and make it, you know, just make my own direction. Carve your own way, yeah. What did your parents do for work? My dad worked actually as a, uh, first in a factory, in a, you know, garment factory, and then he was a tailor. So it was in the garment industry, but it wasn't one of the owners. He was really just a, uh, you know, he worked there. And then after that, you know, there were other things that he did, but that was really the start. And my mom uh, was a homemaker. So she took care of the family, but she also worked part-time in a bakery. So they were both hardworking people trying to make enough money to support a family. Earn a living, make, yeah, absolutely. So when you were young, did you have any early aspirations of what you wanted to be when you grew up? Did you dream about being 
a great success in X, Y, or Z? Or what were your thoughts as a youth? Yeah, I'm trying to really remember. I don't know that I had, I didn't have the life experiences to really, you know, think of like, okay, what am I, what do I really want to do? And so the expectation at that time was, okay, you know, what do girls do? Maybe you could be a teacher, you know, maybe you could, you know, it was more along just what I was familiar with. And so no real great expectations. The going to college was an opening experience because just a mind opening experience, because it really just looked at like, okay, you know, what is really interesting to me? Not that I really knew, but I was a major in psychology. So people and psychology was interesting to me and and was really mainly about people. So that's that was my first inkling of, you know, what am I going to do when I grow up? And where'd you go to college? I went to Brooklyn College, which Brooklyn is part college. of the City University of New York. So another interesting sort of fact that the psychology component of your profession today is hugely important, yes. right? I mean, the emotional stress and just the weight of, you know, buying and selling multi-million dollar property, it's the largest financial transaction for, for most of us, right? Yeah. So being able to navigate the psychology of it is is humongous. Absolutely. It is. I use psychology every single day, every pretty much every minute of the day. And so graduating with a degree in psychology, there's really nothing you can do. You know, you have to either get a PhD or, or you know, really it's not, it doesn't really prepare you for anything, but it does prepare you for life. And it does prepare, you know, prepared me for what I'm doing in real estate, which is every, you know, there's every minute of every day I am thinking and feeling and relating to people and what their emotions are and what their aspirations are and what they know and what they don't know and what they think they want and, and what's behind all of all of the things that they say that they think that they want. So for fun, the next time a stranger asks you what you do for a living, tell them you're a psychologist who sells real estate. Yes, that's <laughs> perfect. That's actually perfect because that's really the truth. <laughs> that's great. How did you get into real estate? Let's jump into how did we get here? How do we start? Okay, so I graduated college and I was living in New York and came out to Los Angeles just because it was sunny that day and it looked like a great idea, but really not prepared for anything. So I uh, started out as a uh, teacher and second grade teacher. And then after that, it just, I didn't really connect with that particularly. I mean, I liked it, but it wasn't really just getting me where I wanted to be. And so I had, I was married. I had a, uh, bought my first home with, I had no money because, you know, I was young and, you know, bought my first home with my ex-husband with virtually nothing down because I had, my parents loaned, loaned us some of the money for the initial down payment. I had the seller carry back. And then, so no money down because we didn't have any, but did a little fix up and two years later sold it for a huge profit in my mind. So, and I said, oh my goodness, this is brilliant. Real estate, you know, you can, you can buy something, you make money, you can live in it, you can, all of these yeah. things. And so that was really the start of my career and saying, okay, that was my first First introduction to real estate, and and went on from there. And you saw the power of just in it. what you said was was very eloquent in that stocks you can't use. There's no utility value in terms of your daily life. You know, real estate you can live there. You right. can you know, which is not, it's awesome. So tell me about your first sale. I'm always curious on you know first sales. You remember what that was? Well, the first sale here was it was mine going to be different than many other people because I just I took the uh, limited amount of money that I made from the from the sale of my first little house that was my residence and I bought uh, I bought another property to live in with as little down as possible and took the rest of the uh, proceeds that I had and I said okay I'm going to buy as many homes as I possibly can and do the same formula. So I so I then got my real estate license. And so I was my first customer. So just with the power of real estate. So I was just, that was, that was the start. And then I had friends who said, oh my goodness, this is, this looks great. Yeah, you're doing you something know, special yes, here. Look yes, what, yes, yes. Yeah. So I uh, just, then I, I started selling real estate for them. So it was a, a little bit of a different twist than most people who start in real estate. It's very interesting and, and powerful because 
you do it for yourself first, figure it out, make the mistakes and learn and, and, mm -hmm. and also learn the power of it and the benefit and the value. That's cool. You've had a lot of sales in your career, which we're going to get into some of your accolades mm -hmm. in a bit. What's your favorite sale? Do you have a favorite? Like, I just remember this one particular sale that, you know, has stayed with me for X, Y, or Z. Is there any, any favorite? Well, there are a lot of sales that are... You know, I mean, every sale is different because, it, again, it's about the people and just making something happen. Uh, having someone really, a home is, is huge and, and, and a purchase of a property is really huge. And it's one of the most important and emotional things that happen in someone's life. But so there's every one of them is, is different. And I can't say that, you know, I mean, I have lots of them that stick out in my mind, but the one that was a key t uh, turning point for me was when I sold, represented and sold the Spelling Manor. So that was a huge property and that was a big accomplishment. Uh, at the time, it was the most expensive property in the entire world. But I put that up for sale for $150 million and that was an insane number. And it was clearly, it was the most expensive listed property in the world. And so, that was, you know, and everything that went along with that, just the outreach and coming up with a marketing strategy and how am I going to ever sell this and who would right. ever buy this and who's the audience and how do I reach them and all of that. So that was one it was favored, you know, because it really, it was, it taught me so much and it was instrumental in a lot of the things I did after that. It was groundbreaking in many ways, starting with the price and the whole everything. Let me ask you a question, like how does one get a listing, a spelling manner listing. How, like, how does, how did that come about? Well, that came about, I mean, this was not my first sale representing Candy Spelling. It was actually the sixth. So there was a lead up to it. So it really would go with like, okay, how do I, how do you even start to get that down that road? So you had a track record that was years in development. Yeah. And so I did have a track record. I did uh, have an introduction to to candy spelling by uh, you know through another source just someone who connected me with her and then with that there were other properties that I did represent her and so after that that was really the lead up to getting such a monumental and and impressive property to represent and then how do you how does i mean the price you know Warren Buffett has one of my favorite quotes like what it says price is what you pay value is what you get mhm mm like and with the spelling, you know, manner, like how do you arrive at a final, okay, let's go to market with this price? Because there's no comps, there's no prior sale, there's no, there. it's just like, it's such an extraordinary, unique, exceptional, you know, estate. How do you arrive at, how do you, is it, was it difficult to arrive at a price or is well, it more of it, a gut feeling or? It was really a marketing strategy. So it came with a marketing strategy. So the property is unique, fantastic property. It's in an amazing location. The grounds are, you know, on five acres of land in Homeby Hills. Really never can be repeated, right? Can Where? never, right. So just to get that is, is really unique. And, and the house itself was 56,000 square feet uh, and then another 17,000 square feet of finished attic space. So it's like 70, you know, you know over 70,000 square feet of, of living space yeah. in in one structure, a so hotel. It's, yeah, and beautiful, so very, very impressive. But it is the strategy here is was you know how what are we going to do to sell this property? Right, right. What is the thought? How you know how am I going to uh, you know get it out there? And the one hundred fifty million dollar price tag was really part of it was we wanted to make it the most expensive property in the world. Yeah. So from a marketing strategy, it was very unique, very special, very looking, for, looking for a billionaire, and how do we do that? And, and yeah, putting it so, you know, it, it's a must sort of, it's so exclusive, it's the most expensive, most this, most that, and it, there's, it's scarcity, right? There's only is, one, there's only one of them right. and in it, the world. Exactly. And if, you know, you don't buy this one, that's it. There's no more, you know, and so, and that's uh, the fact of making something unique and making it special. And that was the whole plan. Have you heard of the $70 cup of coffee? Oh, <laughs> Have you heard of this? no, I haven't. So I forget which local coffee chain did it, but they, same concept. They go, let's be absurd. They bought some 
premium bean or something, and I'm probably getting this story totally wrong, but but the bottom line is they came out with the world's most expensive cup of coffee, 70 bucks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, part PR gimmick, part marketing sort of genius, and people were buying it because it was the world's most expensive cup of coffee, 70 bucks. You okay, know, well. Just for the experience. Yes, yes. Whether it was good or not is not the point. You well, know? Was it good? Do we I don't know? know. I didn't try it. We don't know. So <laughs> fans who have, uh, who have tried that $70 cup of coffee, please comment. Send your, send your uh, reviews. When did you sell, like, your first big home? Like, let's call it over $10 million. Like, what was that? You know, when you hit a, a plateau of like, oh my gosh, this home was over 10. Like, what was that first home like or first? I'm trying to remember. There is, uh, you know, $10 million is a lot of money. Right, I mean, right. That, that's, you know, here in Los Angeles, we look at that and say, I mean, okay, it's luxury. It, you know, when I, I mean, luxury used to be a million dollars. million dollars right. is still, that's a lot of money. Lot of money. All money. of these are a lot yeah. of money. But you know what's sad though? Not sad. What's it's crazy, not sad. Ten million really in this market in Beverly Hills in West LA is not a lot of money. Like there's probably seven, eighty listings or a hundred homes for sale over ten million. No. Right now. There are. There yeah. are more so, than that. So. <laughs> there are more than that. But it's just a lot of money and, and it's hard for people to relate yeah. really anywhere else in the in the country to what we're talking about here. In prices, and we have, uh, you know, ten million. I have, uh, I mean, I have three listings that are over a hundred million. That is just mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. And how, in your mind, how many people on earth can realistically afford that? What does the market look like for that buyer? Well, the billionaires. There's somewhere in the range of about two thousand billionaires that would be candidates for the property. Uh, for a property that's a hundred million dollars mm-hmm. uh, more, and then so they're out there in the entire world. Then they have to want to come and buy a property here in Los Angeles. Then they have to like the property that they're buying, and they have to you know be motivated to do it. So it really narrows down that list of candidates to really a very small number. Three thousand gets down to. 30 or 18 or something right yes yeah, so so I so there is a target and so I, I you know so in looking at you know really when you look at any of these properties it's really for any property for yeah. any, no matter what size of the property who is the buyer who's our target buyer whether it's a, you know is it a family is it you know in, in any yeah. price range and then how do you reach them and so when you get to the luxury and the super luxury the number goes down and what they're looking for is specific and then it's how do you how do you reach those and this is what this is what i think makes you so special sally is that if you're dealing with that type of listing super luxury 150 million 75 million you've got to go with people like yourself and there's only a few of them really that that it's not that people aren't capable but it's your experience and your networking and the you you've worked with those 3000 or 2000 billionaires you know them they're in your rolodex they're you know they you can text a lot of them kind of thing you know what i mean that's invaluable to yes. to a seller because it it could take a lifetime to even build a fraction of that of that group as as a, a group that you can communicate with on a regular basis right right and some of that exactly as you say is credibility and and connection and being able to have that outreach but it's still a lot of work oh it's none of this none of this happens by itself you talk about psychology right psychology of billionaires you know buying 100 million dollar homes is probably on a whole new whole new level altogether right very different that's a big difference because they don't have to buy it they don't have you know everyone's lives you know the thing about real estate is that Everyone pretty much can identify with real estate because they either live in a home, they live in an apartment, they live somewhere, and or they grew up living somewhere, and they can identify with that. But when it comes to, you know, someone who's buying an ultra luxury property and it is their second or third or fourth or fifth residence, they don't have to buy it. It is much more of a discretionary buy. 
And so it is motivating them to buy it and, and you know, getting them at the right time. And when, when you lose them, they're gone. When they've lost interest, it's over. So yeah. it's very, from a psychology point of view, very different. Oh, I can only imagine it's way, it's way harder. It's almost like the, you have to position it as like, this, is, this will fulfill something in their life that they're missing. It's not a property per se. You know, like you said, they it's, don't need it. They don't need this. It's finding the psychology where they, it's they're finding a piece of them by owning this property yeah. or fulfilling it's, something. It's really lifestyle and experience. And what are they going to feel like? What is it going to feel like to live in this house and enjoy it? And, and what are the experiences and the emotional aspects and painting that picture? And that's that's really what resonates. Mm -hmm. They don't have to buy it. And it is, and it's you're only going to buy it if you want it. And you're only going to want it if you are imagining or picturing what you're going to be experiencing, living and, and doing and, and, and your lifestyle. Well stated. What do you think? I mean, we talked a lot about psychology and how important it is, you know, for representing homes that are over $50 million. Like what do agents need to have special attributes? I mean, beyond psychology, the psychology aspect of, of it. To be able to just navigate at that level because it's such a different market. Is there anything that you could say? Oh, you know, agents need to possess this kind of a skill set or or knowledge if you're going to deal at this high end. This is very rarefied. There's you know when you're going you know there's luxury. There's like a million. There's five million is is luxury. Yeah. Ten million. All of these ten million is luxury. Twenty. We have all these breakpoints. Again, there's only a handful of properties that sell at these price points. So, you know, we've had in, in uh, 2019, this year, we've only had, I think it's six properties that have sold that in our marketplace here, in the greater Los Angeles area that have sold for over, uh, you know, for over $40 million. So there's not, you know, there's not a lot of sales. And so the brokers or the agents that are working these types of luxury properties. And one is you have to, there is a psychology we talked about, but you have to be motivated. You have to work. You have to be innovative. You have to feel good about doing an outreach because it's not necessarily going to be just coming to you. You have to work mm -hmm. at finding that buyer and connecting and, and thinking about, uh, you know, on a continual basis what you know what is the property like what is unique about it? what's special how am i going to find that buyer and constantly you know looking at that because you that's, have to that's, create you have to create the need you have to create the need that's exactly well said right on all right you know why i know that sally i used to sell life insurance oh okay there you go <laughs> there as you a 22 know. year old uh -huh. sold it for three years and i got the best sales experience of my life and you can just imagine a 22 year old you know kid trying to sell life insurance to uh you know people much older it was quite an experience but it was yeah, selling the need exactly and here we're creating that need it's awesome so i have a question that's just arose on this like with the economy and different real estate cycles when you get to the uber luxury 50 million the, the buyers of that are they sensitive are they, are they looking for a deal I'm like oh gosh the market just crashed like Good. I'm going to go pick up my trophy seventy million dollar state for fifty instead of seventy. Are they? Do they think that way, or it's not even doesn't enter the equation? Like, there's no. Oh, now's the time to to get in, you know, because the market's crashing. I can I can really go get that monster deal, and save ten million. Or is it? That's really not part it's, of the equation. Yes and no. Okay, so they did not make all the money that they have by not being cognizant of what's going on in the market and looking at, at money and, and the value of money. So the value of money is important. So they really, it's more of, they don't want to uh, do something that's foolish as opposed to maybe making the, you know, the best deal, because it's still a residence. It's not a company, it's not a business, it's not, you know, it's not income producing. It is still going to be primarily for their enjoyment. So it's more, of they don't want to look foolish and make a bad decision as opposed to getting the best possible deal. 
So it's a little twist on what most people yeah. in a different economic bra uh, yeah. bracket would be looking at. Makes sense. They don't want to be foolish. They want to make a, uh, you know, they want to feel like they're doing something that's prudent. Right. But it's still on a discretionary. It's discretionary. Yeah, which is a big underlined bold. It's still, it's a discretionary discretionary world at that level. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So and they they're buying it because they want it. Who's been the biggest influence? in your career thus far like when you were coming up you know i know you started doing your own thing mm -hmm. but when you started dealing with other people and growing your real estate business um was there anyone in, in any other agents or brokers or owners or people that had a big influence or just in, anyone in general that was like you know propelled you and made you think bigger or or expand your sort of worldview on you know what's possible i can't point to one person there are people who have clearly been influenced very you know critical influences in what i've been doing here and, and just growing and and my need to, I, i'm going to say just my desire and some of it is really need to keep going because it's, it's you know i have to analyze why why do i do what i'm doing but one of them is is really my you know my mother and just as a role model and uh just you know being positive I'm a very positive person, so I look at it and, you know, I, I don't take a lot of the, uh, I look at things as challenges and I'm, I, I don't let the negative really weigh me down. That I got really from my mom and that's, you know, a critical thing. So there's a, you know, just achieving and growing and doing and it's, you know, there, there are failures all the time. You don't make every deal. And so like, okay, what do you do with that? When you don't, you know, do like, you know, go and, uh, you know, crawl into bed and stay underneath the covers for the next month. Or what do you do? Do you let it go? And so so that is really positive. It's really, you know, from my mom is, is just like, OK, just moving forward. So that's one. And, uh, you know, I have a business coach that helps me. They're just looking, just keeping an eye on what am I doing? I mean, I do this it really as a business. I do it, I, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy the real estate aspect. I really enjoy the selling. I really enjoy people. And I enjoy that every day is a new day. And I never know what's going to happen. And that keeps me excited. But I still look at it as a business. So I am looking, okay, what am I doing? Am I, you know, I don't just show property, I sell property. Yeah. I look at the business aspects of it and, and okay, and I have a business plan. So that is, a lot of that is really with coaching. You know, it's in, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, the agents that have realized the success or a portion of the su success that you have reached in this industry, which is monumental, they do have that perspective. It is a business. It's not, they're not an agent, you know, a sale. They're not just an agent. They're, if they treat their business and what they're doing, you know, with, with sort of the proper respect and, and just sort of perspective, it's, this is a business good things can happen that's when yeah that's when sort of the paradigm shifts right yeah no and i and i definitely look at it as a business uh and i know exactly you know where uh from financial aspect where we're going and uh, whether we're achieving goals and and you know just income expenses all of that is, is on, a, on a continual basis so what's the biggest mistake you've made or you know failure what was there any big like oops moment in your career where you can look back on and, and say you, you learned something? You know, there's a lot of different things that are turning points or changes. I, I've uh, been to, I really was in all aspects of real estate. And uh, so with, from the residential to the commercial, to property management, to mortgage brokerage, to development. So I'm, I'm very well, uh, you know, versed in every aspect of real estate. And so there were, uh, you know, with that, there was during uh, the different economic downturns. So some not uh, it was not always perfect, and so there were downturns and where I was not as successful as I would have liked. And so those were oops, you know, just mm -hmm. like okay, just looking at it, and just thinking that things are just going to always be going up when they're not. And so there are cycles. And so where you are in that cycle and just being able to carry through is, is really a learning experience. So I want to give our audience some context around some of the truly amazing things that you've accomplished. Maybe we should have done this sooner, but I kind of like to do it later. I think it adds a little bit more sort of value to, you know, we're sort of mid-conversation. But 
You have a total career sales volume of six billion dollars, Sally. That's a big number. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it is a big number. It's a big number. <laughs> six, six billion. Billion dollars. Yeah, and going up and every going day, up. hopefully. Going up. <laughs> And you're currently ranked this year, 2019, uh, number 27, total team sales volume of $354 million. And last year, in 2018, you closed over $375 million. Your current listing inventory, active and off-market, is over $2 billion. I mean, imagine, I mean, a $2 billion listing inventory is... It's pretty out- it's, insane. It's insane. Pretty insane. It is just really, when you think of that, that is... That's a, a market big that's bigger number. than some markets, like, <laughs> right. like by themselves. Yeah, um, that's a big number. We talked about the, the Spelling Manor for $150 million, which sold for $85 million. And you've also made history with the, with the, the owner of, uh, or the creator of Mar- Minecraft selling. Did you list that home or did you sell? I sold the property. I represented the buyer. The buyer, okay. That was an amazing home. Or yeah, is that amazing was, home. That yeah. was. It was great. Yeah. It was, it was uh, really exciting. And of course, you've been recognized by all the major media outlets as a top producing agent in LA and internationally and globally. You represent states and villas and all over the world, right? I do. I do. Yeah. I I represented in uh, in Canada and and I represent actually in Mexico right now. Uh, The La Berge Hotel is being built near Punta Minta. Mm -hmm. And so uh, representing the villas that are going to be the residences in Punta Minta. That's great. So without, I want to say it formally to you, congratulations on all your success because it's it's amazing. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate it. So interesting. I want to bring up since you brought up Mexico. What we've learned as a media company, you know, Diggs, is the markets that we're in, you know, South Bay and West Side, we started doing, we did our first uh, Mexico special edition. We did mm-hmm. a Hawaii special edition last last couple of years. The amount of money that, that actually originates from here buying there like the market is bigger right. here for that market than it is there obviously right no correct uh, for sure so for it sure. totally the, makes the, sense right the audience is here i'm i'm representing you know the buyers that i'm looking for are los angeles you know greater los angeles right. based buyers for mexico i mean think about the wealth that's between you know malibu and pv you know the coastal areas and then up through beverly hills and you know Hollywood and what have you and Los Feliz I mean that wealth is just that pocket of wealth and affluence is probably the largest in the entire country don't you think yeah no there's uh, it's mind boggling really when you look at how much money there really is out here yeah so let's talk about the hyper competitive world of LA real estate for a moment you made headlines earlier last year by moving your entire team to Compass you were with uh, John Arrow, right, Bef- prior? Yes, I was with John Arrow, who was, then was uh, sold to Pacific Union. Yep, and then eventually, who eventually became part of Compass right, right, later. Right, so you right. were an early adopter of Compass. Why the move? I mean, a Compass is, is, is just different. It's just much more of a young, hip, marketing-based and technology-based, just a different type of a vibe and a different type of a company. And it was very attractive to me to bring my team here and just have a a different experience. So Compass continues to disrupt and grow at a torrid pace, attracting top players in the industry like yourself. Where do you see Compass, you know, in the next five years? Compass has made huge, huge strides. I mean, they came from literally nowhere. I mean, they're uh, about a seven- or eight-year-old company, and they are now in just uh, every major marketplace in the country with a huge share in the whole Bay Area. There's something like 40% market share, which wow. is which is huge. Again, so they're, they're just a different type of a company, and so they're, they are viewed more of a marketing and tech and real estate company, so it's not just real estate, but where uh, their growth is continuing, and they're continually trying to uh, be more innovative and, and uh, just have a different twist and, and sort of viewing themselves as, as Amazon of real estate, where their goal is to be in every aspect of the home experience. So that's their goal. And so, I, and so far, they seem to be rapidly going in that direction. Yeah. And it's been quite you know, amazing what how much they've disrupted the industry in that short amount of time, and the growth and the the 
and really have just sort of changed the whole sort of legacy brokerage model, you know, into like, let's get with it. You know, the world's about, you know, digital, social, empowering the consumer. And, and it's all about marketing and real estate. I mean, the world's all about marketing, but in real estate, it's all about marketing. And so I think they, they're they onto something. Obviously, it's the proof is in how they've grown, right? Yes. Yeah, it's been very, very dramatic. So let's talk about like today's buyers and sellers. I mean, they're more sophisticated and educated than ever, right? With their, they're empowered with, with tools online and, and, you know, the data and different things. Like, do they, in, in your sort of, we just talked about Compass. I mean, do they, do they even care? Is it, do they put any sort of value on the brokerage or is it just all in the agent? Like, does, like in your travels, do they say, well, which, tell me about your broker or is it just like, no, it's Sally and her team. Like we're, you know what I mean? Yeah. It is mainly about Sally and team. So it's the SFJ group. Yeah. And so it's what do we have to offer and what, do, you know, because real estate still is very hands on. Yeah. It is a, a, a consumer to the broker yeah. uh, on, a, on a personal level. But the company does make a difference. Uh, when I first moved my entire group from Pacific Union, which is 25 people. Well, it was 25 now. It's uh, like 34. Wow. Huh. Yeah, so it's, it's a big great. group. Big so it's group. a big move. Yeah. But when I did that, it was Compass was not well known in uh, Beverly Hills area and the Los Angeles area. And it was a almost I had to apologize for what the company was and explain it. It was like, what, who, what, where? So it does matter. But the primary, primary is really who, who is, you know, who is the agent? And who are the who's the uh, buyer or the seller going to be dealing with? What are your thoughts on the reality TV landscape in LA? Do you think it helps or hurts the consumer perception in the marketplace? You know. Well, I think that it's that's in, it's TV and it's entertainment value. So it's you know, and I think that's what it's really. It's not made to. I mean, it has to attract attention. It has to be entertaining, or else no one's going to watch it. So what you see there is not really what the real estate experience is per se. It's a fictionalized version. And what has it helped? I mean, I've, I've seen some and I said, oh my gosh, if I would never, you know, I mean, if I really did that, some of those things, I mean, uh, you know, what does someone really think of someone who's, you know, not to put anything down here, but is just, you know, jumping up and down and, and, and just carrying on. Uh, so from that respect, it, I don't think it, puts real estate brokers in a favorable light, but it is entertaining and and people relate to that and they do relate to the, you know, they want to watch these shows. So there's something there. So on LA, so this is sort of a segue into like, I mean, this market has so many, obviously big agents, mega, mega agents, a lot of obviously high profile properties and top producing agents. Is the competition pretty intense in LA? Is it like, Maybe is is it more intense because you've got so much high pro- profile A inventory B producers. What, what's your thoughts on that? I think it's intense. I I can't say if it's more intense than it would be in some other uh, areas like San Francisco or New York that are high. Also, again, with a lot of affluent buyers and sellers and clients, but it's very intense here. There's a lot of money at stake. Any one of these luxury properties, the sales, you know, there's a lot of commission at stake. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of competition. So it is uh, very, very competitive. Is it getting better or worse, you think? I can't say that it's getting better. So, <laughs> so, it's, getting, so it's either. It's I'm going to just tougher. go, I'm going to say it's very competitive. Yeah. <laughs> So have you heard, heard the term frenemies? Frenemies, yeah, yeah. sort of. <laughs> so it's, yeah, we're, you know, you're friendly, but you're enemies. So it's kind of yeah. merging of the, we're friends, but enemies, we're frenemies. Yep. We nope. exist, but we, you know. And and that's exactly, exactly what happens here. You, you know who all the other players are. You know who the competition is as an agent with other agents. And you have to work together because... It is for the common good uh, when you're buying and selling and someone may have a property that your client needs or wants. So you have to work well together, but it is very competitive. So you're not always on the same side. All right. So let me put you on the spot a bit here, mm-hmm. Sally, and we'll have a little fun with this. Okay. Let's create a fictitious competitive scenario. 
Okay. So later today, you have a listing presentation in Bel Air for a $50 million home. And prior to the meeting, the seller has told you she has met with, and for fun, I'll use the first names only, Mauricio, Valerie, Aaron, Drew, Joyce, Jeff, and Jade. Okay. I could keep got going. It. <laughs> you got it. I got it. You got it. Why should they hire you? Okay, so... Uh, so I, yeah, so I know all the players. There's lots of players <laughs> out there. So we're going to just uh, go with that. And uh, some of what is, is from a competitive standpoint, you know who the other players are and what their pitch may or may not be. So going into any one of these appointments, uh, you, you have an idea of who the, what the landscape is. So why they would hire me is because in reality, for me, I know I'm really committed. I know I'm going to really do everything possible to sell the property, work on it, get the highest price, have the client's interest at heart, and just make it all happening. I know that from a marketing standpoint, my marketing is better. I have, I have four people, staff, on my team that are just committed to marketing that particular property, that listing, that property, which is all that seller wants to know. They don't really care about what you're doing, about anyone else. They just want to know, what are you going to do for me? And so it is really relating to them, looking at what their needs are. And I know that I will be doing a good job. I'm committed to that and I feel it. And I know that my marketing uh, support will be there and and it's very, very hands-on. So it's really that belief. I go into every single listing appointment with the, you know, I'm getting that listing. I'm always amazed when I don't, you know, it's like, uh, why? But, but I'm going into it committed to get it because I really truly believe that I will do the best job. And I feel your commitment. So for <laughs> our listening audience who's not, can't see this during that last couple of minutes, Sally was staring me straight in the eye with <laughs> conviction and passion. <laughs> And I'm giving you my listing here. Here's okay, 50. <laughs> okay. Well and done. I'll take care of you. <laughs> that was awesome. So are you seeing, you know, I know it, maybe not in this, this world, but maybe someday soon, like discount brokers. It's not a new thing, obviously. It's an old thing, but it's now, you know, it's maybe perhaps more well-funded. Some of these, dis, you know, dis, discount brokers. And maybe you've heard of this whole iBuyer, you know, phenomenon. And, and I just read literally this morning. On the way here, this year's prop tech has has uh, there's been 25 billion dollars already invested in prop tech, like the whole technology trying to you know change the game and disrupt. Are you seeing any of that uh, on at this level? Any like discounting? I mean, yeah. brokers or i buyer stuff? I really don't see that that much, and particularly in when you're going to the luxury. It's very much who do you know, what do you, who that buyer is, how you're going to market it, how you're going to reach it, what is special. It is a different, it's not a tract home. So on, on a lower level where there's less uniqueness, maybe that will have more of an impact. Uh, the other thing that is that, uh, that I think on, uh, again, on the luxury level is that as the, the market is, in, has been a little more challenging and it's been, there has been a shift. And as there is more of a shift in the marketplace, it's much more important to really have a broker who is just really knows what they're doing and it can really just really think and do and change and be nimble in the, in the approach. Question for you. So this relates to commission. Obviously, big commissions, big, obviously big with higher price points, right? Are these sellers at this level, say over 20 million, are they shrewd negotiators on commission? Is commission like a, a sort of arm wrestle point of discussion? Does it come down to like commission or is there like, is there a new standard or is there any changes with that? Like, hey, there's a flat fee if you're over 25 million or, or is it all just dynamic sort of different for each party or it's dynamic i mean there's uh, there's commission is a discussion at every price point and and it's really just focusing uh the seller on uh you know stop looking at what i'm going to be making and let's see what i'm going to be doing for you and what yeah, your yeah. net's going to be and so that's really the conversation and that's the appropriate conversation yeah 
who, which agent, which broker is going to actually get more money in your pocket right. as opposed to their mm. pocket. And it's a tremendous investment on your end to create the need. It costs a lot more money to create a need than, than when you have 10 buyers lined up, you know, 10 offers over, over asking and you're trying to figure out which one to take. No, absolutely. Right. Having a, a representing... Whole different ballgame representing the ultra luxury properties cost a lot of money yeah. because they don't sell every day. You have to really have much more time in, and money invested in getting those properties sold. All right, enough about real estate for a minute, Sally. Let's have some fun. You have six children and 12 grandchildren. Congratulations. That's Thank you. That's like a lot. That's but a it's, lot. But that's it's amazing. true. It's true. So first question, obvious question, like how do you and how have you created a work-life balance? Like, So I, I look at what's really important to me, and what's important to me is I love my work. I do really love what I do, and I also love my family, and I you know, travel, and I work out, and I really have been able to create a life balance. So what I've given up is sleeping. I don't really sleep, <laughs> you know, because I do have to, like, utilize every minute no time of, those, for sleep. <laughs> of those 24 hours to be everywhere. But so I don't sleep as much as maybe some other people yeah. uh, would. But I, um, you know, I look at what's important to me. And yeah. my family's really important. And so I spend time with all of them. That's great. And where, where do you like to travel? Where do I like to travel? Yeah. I like to travel everywhere. Everywhere? everywhere. Do you have a favorite spot? Well, I, you know, I, I, I love the, I mean, I, I love the, like, uh, the Amalfi Coast. So Italy's great. I've been to a lot of different parts of the world. And so all of them, all of them are really fun because it's, again, it's about the people for me. And I love the experiences of just meeting people everywhere and talking to them and, and seeing what their lives are. And basically everyone looks for the same thing. Everyone wants to be happy and, and uh, enjoy, you know, enjoy every day. And do you actually, do you live in Beverly Hills? I don't. You don't? I what? live close by. I live, uh, I live in Little Homeby. Okay, Little Homeby. Okay. So with like the spelling manner and these different, these, these really high profile clientele that you represent, do you, do you ever become friendly with them? Or is it like, hey, you know, Candy and I are, we go have lunch every blah, blah, blah. Or do you, does, it, does some of these transactions turn into... Because they're so involved, there's so much emotion and psychology, and they take longer normally, obviously, right? You develop friendships out of them? Most of the time, I, I, uh, I look at my clients as lifelong, you know, there, there's a relationship. This is a, an intense relationship going so, so through it's not a buying, transaction. Buying and it, selling. It's and a, so, yeah. So it, it's a relationship, and uh, I'm in a, in a position, fortunately, where I don't have to deal with people that I represent, you know, people that I don't want to represent, except if they're on the other side and my client wants that property. But, uh, you know, representing the client itself, you know, I, uh, you know, I have fired clients and I have kept most of my clients have, have been lifelong clients or friends and that they've really turned into friends and, and uh, just, yeah, yeah, for the years. And part of the relationship is... You know, just just uh, I'm looking at that. Those are I, I have repeat relationships and repeat sales with the same buyers. So and they refer their friends. And so it is it's really a, a uh, commitment is yeah. I look at it as a long term commitment. Working and, together is, is really a relationship. And it's really kudos to you for it. It's a high pressure commitment for you because you, like you're dealing with this this caliber of, of you know, wealth um, and the pressure to to perform at this level you know those referrals it's even almost more stressful right it's like hey you know Sally sold my 50 million dollar home she can sell your you know it's like which is great but it's also a lot of pressure right yeah. I'm sure what I do with my clients though is okay I, I represent them in in every transaction that's my plan it's just to so if they have a child that they want to buy a three hundred thousand dollar condo for, I, I'm taking care of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it's leasing, uh, you know, leasing an apartment, you know, just uh, yeah, I'm taking care of that. So it is. It's on every level. It's more of who that who the client is and yeah. who the, uh, that's great. And just taking care of the whole family. 
That's awesome. So it's it's client for life, and it's almost like real estate wealth advisor. Yes. Advisor, you're like you're a steward of that whole sort of asset class for them. Yes, and I so I never look at a transaction as one transaction. So it's I'm never going to t- to encourage a client to buy or sell or do anything that I don't truly believe is the right thing for them. So and that's and and so that's. You know, that translates again into something where they appreciate that. They know it and they appreciate it. So you must have had a can't believe it happened funny real estate story. Is there any sort of blooper like real estate? Like, oh, my gosh, I was showing this property to, you know, like, is there anything you could share that's that's fun or over the top? Like reality that would that belongs on reality TV? Well, there's, there's, <laughs> yes, there's, there's, there's lots of those, <laughs> or at least, you know, but um, I can think of uh, one right now. And a lot of sales are, you know, are, are for life experiences. There's, you know, you have a baby, you get married, you get divorced, someone dies, or you just want a bigger house or a smaller house or something. And so I have frequently, I have divorce situations. And so I can think of one where they, they were getting divorced and they, they literally couldn't be in the same room together. And so the uh, in this case, we were at the house and, uh, and uh, the husband was, was had custody of the house and the wife came. So I have the listing agreement all set and I have the, the uh, husband signs and the wife comes and, and I, you know, it's, it's up a long driveway. And so I'm I'm parked in the driveway and the wife comes and uh, she pulls up in the driveway behind and she comes in and we're sitting there and the two of them have this, you know, he signed, I need her to sign, I need to leave. And two of them have this major fight and I'm trapped, okay? I'm trapped because she's blocking my car, I can't get out. And so it's literally calling the police. The police had to come, break up their fight and you know, release my car yeah, so I can just you off the yes, so that I can actually exit and and be out of there. So those are those. I mean, just uh, you know, very stressful. But Who these said things this wasn't happen. A tough business. Yeah, right. look at the obstacles and yeah, yeah these things happen. That's that's amazing. So let's let's get back to real estate a little bit. Um, just quickly, get your industry insight. How's the market been this year? Are we are we heading into the beginning of, of the new cycle, real estate cyclical every 10 years ish, right? We start to see slowdowns and, and peaks and troughs and what have you. What's your thoughts? Well, my first thought is that the yes, there are peaks and troughs and, and cycles. And I've been doing this long enough where I've experienced them. And, and, and I know, you know, I know that they they're part of real estate in the long in the long run. Real estate's great. Yeah. And it's going to you know, I truly believe it's going to keep on going up in the short run, any given moment, you know, you know, things change. And the good news here in Los Angeles is that our market here is the strongest market in the country. So our market is stronger than it is in New York and San Francisco and Miami and the other big metropolises. And Los Angeles has become much more of an international city where we have buyers who really want to have a stronghold here or want to have a residence. And so we, and we have, you know, so that's been important. We also have Silicon Beach now, so where the tech industry is coming. So we've been in a really good place. But, and here's the but, is that our market is not as strong as it was a year ago or two years ago. So we are in a uh, little bit of a transition where buyers are feeling more uncomfortable. Uh, should I buy? Shouldn't I buy? Is this a good time? What should I do? And any time that that happens, I mean, interest rates are low, which is great. But any time that there is a transition or people are feeling uncomfortable, they are afraid to make a decision and yeah. afraid to do anything. So uncertainty is not our friend in the market, right. in any market. But right. it's, it seems like with at this level, my guess would be like geopolitical plays a big role yeah in that uncertainty right totally every day is a new is a new day and the world is global and so what's happening anywhere in the world is affecting us yeah. and the uh, buyers and sellers are just they're just feeling uncomfortable do you think la i mean we, we talked about some of the record-breaking pricing and i mean there's been some crazy high you know what 250 million what were the some of the 
the listing in the last couple of years, the spec homes in Beverly Hill, like yeah, there was a two hundred fifty million dollar property that has been reduced since because it hasn't sold. There is also a five hundred million dollar property that's under construction. Yeah, on, on uh, uh, yeah, in Bel Air on Arrow. Yeah, yeah. So there's you know some of these prices are huge. There was another property that was for sale three hundred fifty million that's been reduced. Do you, do you think the three hundred, two fifty, five hundred is realistic? And you, they are numbers, they're and numbers. so it's how do you quantify what whether something is worth? When you get to those numbers, there's nothing to really say. Okay, this is worth X number. That's, that's a great answer, Sally. <laughs> it, it's it, it's so true. They're numbers, and it's beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? So if somebody deems that five hundred million dollar property as something worth that value, so be it. It's a number. Yeah, it's a number. It's a number. And it's not an exact number. <laughs> and it's arguably, you know, it could be more or less. It's more art than science, right? Yes. <laughs> but so, but you see it realistically like those people were testing the market a bit with these, you know, you know, okay, we are, we're 150, let's benchmark it at 200, 250, 350. Do you think we're go we're still going in that direction or we're, or we're sort of plateaued and we're going to get back into the... Well, to the high hundreds or mid hundreds. I, I, yeah. I think that's. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying that. Mid hundreds yeah. for. Yeah, a lot of those numbers have come down. They have been reduced. So when where if they're not working, then you have to look at you know why they're not working. So they're, they're just the fact that they are. There's nothing. I mean, it's, I can't say it's just pulling a number out of the air, but, but it's pretty much. When at some point, it's yeah. like that. Why? Why any one of those? Numbers? You've got to pick a number. Yeah. You got to pick a number. And if you want to sell and that number is not working, then you have to pick a different number. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's great. It's a little bit of a surprise when you look at, you know, what uh, what has happened because it's one day the price for a ten million dollar home was ten million and all of a sudden the next day it felt like the next day the prices were twenty million. So it is just uh, and and it's, you look at it and say like, okay, what really happened? Right, like why? Right, like, why it was you know? Yeah. How could how could ten million in value be created? In in, in that just time overnight. When it's overnight, yeah. and it's and what that is is like someone saying, okay, well, you know, that house was ten million. You know, why don't we try twenty million? And it's and and the brokers have something to do with this. It's not only the sellers that are looking and saying, okay, I I want that. It is the brokers have input. They, so we create as brokers, you know, some of this these numbers. And you just kind of they, created this monster a little yes. bit, yeah, or propelled, propelled it. Yeah, you know. No, so we we have definite responsibility here too. Yeah, when it comes down to the marketing too, which I want to get into, because that's my favorite topic, and mm -hmm. and I know you're one of yours as well. But I think marketing, the brokerages have done a good job and have, of just creating these elevated pricing and this lifestyle that you know and and made it. It's just a number, you know, it, it's kind of like there's no reality sort of in, in, in the space in, in that sense, of, you know what I mean? When you're dealing with 150 million for a residence, it's not real. I mean, on, on most people's sort of, you know, worldviews, but marketing, I'm a big believer in personal branding for agents. And we talked about, you know, um, your personal brand relative to Compass and what, especially at the high end, what, what are your thoughts on? personal branding for for agents i think uh, branding is is you know critical i've been working on branding and you know for years and years and years so branding is, is critical it, it comes to again for same thing as for a, a you know property why that property and for an agent why that agent and what does that agent have that's unique and stands out and how are you going to look at that when you see any any brand if you see you know you know coca cola you see whatever you you know what that brand is and you have then an a, an anticipation of what that experience is going to be with that brand and so, and that's for a home, and that is for the agent. So when you see agent branding, what is your expectation as the public? Why would they go with you? And, and so, and part of it is that it is your brand. And so the look of your brand, your logo, yeah. uh, the, the, everything about it is... Um, and 99% of agents miss that entirely. I mean, this is, we're in the space. This is what we do. And unfortunately, 
we talked about treating it like a business in this, but it's like everything you do down to the handshake and how you greet somebody, how you do, it's like, that's your brand, you know? And that's your position in the market. And you reinforce your position in the market with everything you do, everything you say, everywhere you are, everywhere your brand is. And when you're putting out crappy flyers or you're doing crappy videos or you're doing, it's like, it, there's no logic and cohesion to the process for most agents. And this is where it falls apart, you know? which is good news for people like you who get it, who get it really and do it and, and invest and, and, you know, reinvest in that branding and what you're doing because, you know, uh, it's so important, right? Really. I am very protective of that. I am very protective of every single marketing piece, every single sign, every single ad, every single thing having to do with my brand. Because it is a reflection on. I'm the on, same way. I look at it like a bit, my baby, you no, know. There's, and you can hand it off, but yeah, I'm watching and I'm 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 concerned. I'm looking. <laughs> no, yeah. so totally. It's just the whole look. Yeah. So nothing ever leaves my office. Yeah. That is not in keeping with the brand and the look. And everyone can have their own brand and their own look. Sure, it sure. doesn't have to be the same at all. But we have a you know a certain criteria. And it's more of an you know, upscale and more sophisticated. And we never have a typo or, I mean, yeah, at least it's all, it's, very, very rarely. And it comes down to also, as you said, handshake or whatever. It is how do you dress? You yeah, know, right. uh, what do you look? What everyone on my team has to look. Uh, I'm, not gonna, there's not a, I'm not going to say they all have to wear a suit and a tie and, and a white shirt. And that's not it. But they all have to have a certain type of... Uh, of being well groomed yeah. and being, you know, well, you know, nicely dressed and, yeah. and a certain look in that regard. No, it's important, and uh, and your brand speaks for itself. I mean, this is this is a big part of why you've been so successful, because your brand, your reputation precedes you in the market. They know what the market knows what they're going to get when they hire Sally Forster Jones. They know it. You know, that's what I try to create, and, yeah. and so I appreciate you saying that because yeah. that's really important to me. If you could define what makes you successful in three words, what would they be? One is I really care, and I really, I really care, and I really like people. So that's one, because that's the primary thing, and I, I work hard, and I think I am really well-balanced. I mean, we touched upon that a little bit, so it's just looking at just, you know, life. And I, just from a personality, I'm just... Uh, you know, I don't. I don't get hysterical. I don't fly off the handle. I. I feel like I'm really. I'm the voice of reason, in dealing with people and looking at uh, what their needs are. So I don't know what those three words are, but. Well, I think that's good. That's great, and I think your perspective is so unique because of where you came from. You know, the those super humble beginnings. I mean, with your parents and just, and to go from there to where you're you're dealing with, selling hundred million dollar homes. Like, it's just mind-blowing, you know what I mean? So I think you're so grounded in, in where you came from and your upbringing has grounded you so much that you're so even keel, like you said. You're, you're so transparent and real, you know what I mean? Everyone's life experiences yeah. really make, you know, add to who they are and color which direction and, and what happens. So, uh, so I, I really do believe that all of my life experiences have changed my where I came from and 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 not being privileged where I had to really work to get well, this whatever is where I the, wanted. I think the care comes in and the conviction, you know, and the, the your passion because it's it's them first, not about you. It's them, and you're here to serve, in a way. Yeah. their needs you know with with care and conviction and and with realness with transparency and all those things i would make a good shrink well, wouldn't this, I, yes so. this sounds really great damn that should be you know <laughs> all good all good <laughs> this turned into commercial yeah. for sally why warm now i appreciate people like yourself who have accomplished great things and not i don't i'm not talking about monetarily that doesn't impress me. You know what I mean? Not, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's more people that can find their path in life by being who they are. And success is just a byproduct of that. You yeah. know what I mean? It wasn't the carrot that drove them. It's just they were who they are. They were, they've always been who they are and they found a way to amplify that to the world and the world took notice. And the end result is the value that's created. Well, that sounds great. 
You very, know what I mean? very well said. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. So closing thoughts, what are two pieces of advice you would give your younger self? You'd say, oh, Sally, I would, don't do this. Well, do, do more of this. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, I'm going to say just uh, smell the roses. We get very wrapped up in uh, succeeding and working and, and just taking every moment as really what it is and enjoying that moment and being present for that moment. So that's, that's one, is, is work is one aspect of life. And so that's been something that I've been working I'm, toward. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the same. That, I would say the same thing if you were to ask me that, mm. for sure. So go ahead. I don't want to end. That was, yeah, no, no. So yeah. but that's one. And, uh, you know, then just looking at what's really just all, what's important to you. What, you know, who are you? And it's not even a younger self because I feel like I've always been true to myself. But it's like, what do, you know, who are you? What do you want? And just being in touch with that. Follow your compass. Ooh. Yay! Ooh. Man, that's another good one. We should keep that on. on that, right? All right, so if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Well, I, I'd uh, be able to, to fly because the traffic has gotten so bad here in L.A. <laughs> that would be you know? a big benefit in L.A., right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, you know, just, yeah, so I can just get from place to place and, and, and uh, yeah, so that... How, how does that one go? Is yeah, that okay? That, yeah. Can I have yeah, that one? Yeah, that's great. I love that one. What would you tell the audience that would be super surprised to hear about you or know about you? I know we covered a lot in this podcast, but is there anything like... Well, that... I, I don't know. People are, are generally surprised when they hear I have like six kids and, and 12 grandkids. So that's a surprise. And I know every single one of their birthdays and, and their names, you know, <laughs> and their middle names. Right. And, you know, so, so, yeah. So that's good. Like, yeah. I don't know what else. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> do you have a favorite architectural style, like dealing with all these homes or anyone that you like, you know, modern? Do you like... Yes, it, it, colonial. Yeah, it changes. It changes. Yeah. I like anything that's well done. Mm -hmm. So I can appreciate, okay, I can appreciate a contemporary that's great or an architectural. And it's it's different on what, and it changes over time because my home is traditional. I'm like kind of bored of traditional. I like to change things up. Mm -hmm. And so I redecorate a lot. Mm -hmm. But so, um, you know, so I'm due for a redecoration right now. But, <laughs> uh, but the contemporaries are great, but kind of like a warmer contemporary right now as yeah. opposed to a colder contemporary. Super so, cold, blue, yeah, yeah, yeah. all glass. Yeah. yeah. So something that's uh, that's also livable, that mm. makes sense Yeah. as opposed to just an art piece. I, I love the art pieces because they're dramatic, but for a livability, I like something that I can live in and know where I am and know where all the rooms are. Yeah. That makes sense. That's awesome. All right, so do you have any closing thoughts or anything you want to share? Any any last uh, nuggets of, of wisdom? Oh, my. Perspective? Uh, well, no, I, I actually like, you know, sharing. I love having a team. I love just really watching them all grow and succeed and helping them. And I really take pride in that. That's sort of like, okay, like having kids. And so, uh, you know, and I'm proud of my kids. I'm proud of the people that they are. And I'm proud of my team and the people that they are and the culture that we have here and, and where they're going, that everybody who is here wants to be here. So... So just really, you know, surrounding yourself with people that you want to be with. That's awesome. So I have one last question I just thought of. Okay. And this is for, for you. You've been, you've experienced so much success and, you know, and the industry continues to evolve and there's new disruption and this and this and that. Is there anything that, that keeps you up at night? I know you don't sleep much, um, but like, is there anything that like worries you in this space, like with your own career or just agents in general? Like what keeps you like what what are you fearful of like in terms of this profession what or what should agents be fearful of what should your contemporaries and your peers be fearful of? like I think things change and I think that it's important to be observant of what's going on in the marketplace and and just with companies and and old school versus new school versus you know, all these i companies and where it's all going so. I can't say it's keeping me up at night, but it's something that I pay attention. I, I just really pay attention on 
whether things are getting bigger, smaller, you know, what, where are the agents going to be, what their relevance is. Mm -hmm. And so, and this goes to, you have to always have, you know, a value statement. And what's your value statement to, in, in, in the industry? You know, and that's for each agent. I mean, that's for me. I, I feel like I know my value statement, but I'm, I'm really very uh, cognizant and, and observant as, as to where things are going and paying attention to that. Awesome. With that, I want to thank you, Sally, for your time. And what a wonderful conversation. It was enlightening. I feel like we're old friends now. Got to know you, get some perspective um, and insight into your business and what makes you so successful. Thank you for sharing and for uh, being a part of our, our podcast. Well, thank you. It's really been fun. And I really, really enjoyed our time together. And that wraps up this episode. Thank you for tuning in and we hope you found some value. Please share, subscribe, and leave a review. Find us on iTunes and your favorite podcast provider. Until next time.